before I begin the uh, analysis review of uh, who is afraid of Charles Darwin? Um, I want to credit, give credit where credit is due. Um, some of the figures that are used in this uh, video are from uh, my friend Jody Hubner. Uh, he has created these um, models, um, done woodworking to create these dinosaurs, and taken his own photos, and he's given me permission to use them as long as I credit him, and also his company is Lighthouse Designs. So prop out to him, and also um, the rest of them are from Darwin's uh, second volume of The Descent of Man, and they are in the public domain, um, and those are sort of a, a bluish rendering uh, through the camera lens, digital camera, of, of some of the um, illustrations in uh, The Descent of Man, the second volume. Hello, Adam Zenz, Theistic Scuffles here, talking a little bit about a very fascinating work of nonfiction by feminist author Griet Vandermassen, uh, entitled Who's Afraid of Charles Darwin? Debating um, Feminism and Evolutionary Theory. Uh, Griet is a, uh, or was a PhD uh, candidate um, studying in Belgium at the time of um, writing the book and um, I am just going to focus on one portion in particular uh, for this video where Griot addresses um, some problems that uh, Darwinism seems to have in being extended um, to the social sciences and in particular uh, Griot addresses um, what has happened uh, with the extension of Darwinism and um, she goes so far as to uh, say that really there wouldn't have been such a thing as social Darwinism that term was invented later in history but for Darwin that would have um, been seen to be uh, pretty straightforward to make uh, both philosophical uh, and political social and moral um, uh, interpretation of his theory so there wouldn't have been a separate interpretation um, resulting from a science the scientific components of Darwinism um, but interestingly a little bit later um, she then she maintains somewhat contrastingly that Darwin dissociated himself um, from social Darwinism and that sounds a little bit puzzling she gives some reasons however for um, why Darwinism should not be uh, equated with the Spenceristic, uh, Herbert Spencer's application of his theory or uh, the Lamarckian um, extension of Darwinism, uh, both of which were uh, deemed unscientific and probably had an unhealthy uh, belief in progress um, due to um, some of the uh, scientific components of, of Darwinism. Um, at any rate, then Griot addresses a pretty severe uh, critic who does correlate um, Darwinism with some of the nastier social and political consequences that it has had historically. And one of those would be um, the eugenics program. Um, yes, it is heard in conversation about the implications of Darwinism, the E word, eugenics. And it, this uh, occurred first in the United States of America um, and well and also in England and before it actually spread um, in, in Germany and Hitler used that as part of the Ubermensch um, idea um, to um, exterminate, to kind of speed up the social Darwinist process and speed up the elimination of the unfit uh, so that the Aryan races would prevail and become the masters of history, the masters of their own destiny, uh, rather than those cowering Jews which were uh, uh, presumably dragging everyone down um, due to their gene pool. Um, so the citation that Griot provides is from an author, Ruth Blyer, um, who wrote Biology and Women's Policy, A View from the Biological Sciences. And um, the citation is as follows. The other side of the coin, the implication of the disastrous effects of the weak, the inferior, or, quote, degenerate on the survival and vigor of the species, or more, more usually the, quote, race, 
became scientific bases for proposals for eugenics programs in the United States and England in the 19th and 20th centuries, and for the ultimate program of extermination of inferior, i.e. non-Aryan, peoples in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. And that's from page 21 of that work. Now, agree it immediately um, wants to qualify true Darwinism from this social Darwinist interpretation. And um, she criticizes Blyer, and she argues that um, she makes a, quote, straight inference, that Blyer's making a straight inference from Darwinism to fascism without providing any justification for this kind of, quote, logic. Now, that's something I think that should give us a little bit of pause. Now, the author, Blyer, um, was pointing out one of the historically contingent causes um, of um, the eugenics and which would be um, Darwinistic uh, theory, even the scientific aspects. So I don't know that this is a fair criticism of Griet van der Maas, and just to simply say that it's a straight inference um, and that there's no justification for this kind of logic. After all, um, according to Ruth Blyer, it has happened in history, and she provides um, reasons for why it, it does occur in history. Um, now, uh, Ruth is, Blyer is not arguing that every, that, excuse me, that the only cause for something heinous and pernicious like a eugenics program where certain supposedly unfit individuals are eliminated from the gene pool, she's not arguing that that can only stem from Darwinist science, from, from an evolutionary um, view of nature. Um, she never said that. So, she says, so it's not in Blyer's view, then it's not a necessary cause. It may be uh, sufficient, but it's not necessary. That's an important distinction to make, and it's one that Griet van der Maassen really doesn't pay attention to and doesn't clarify in this matter. She goes on, uh, Griet goes on and says, a sober reading of Darwin's work reveals that it takes a huge leap of the imagination to pass the responsibility for the evils of fascism onto Darwin. Well, again, I think this um, this kind of makes one do a little bit of a double take. Um, it, it's not that unprecedented. It's not that uh, striking or, or far-reaching um, to make the connection between Darwinism and um, social eugenics since it's already taken place in history. And we don't know of any eugenics program that has stemmed from uh, non-Darwinian um, science. For, for example, pre uh, before Darwin um, scientific theory, we don't know of anything um, social eugenics which was introduced based on pre-Darwinian science. So to me, it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch. Now, why that would have to be a leap of the imagination um, seems a little bit um, overstated at the at the very best. Um, she goes on and says, as to eugenics, this program was not introduced by Darwin, but by his nephew, Sir Francis Galton, and never defended by Darwin. Blyer, however, does not make this clear. Well, there again, that may be technically accurate that Blyer doesn't make that clear, but on the other hand, um, because she doesn't specifically state further connection or correlation between Sir Francis Galton um, <clears throat> who, uh, and, and Charles Darwin doesn't mean that such a connection did not exist or that such a connection is imaginary. Um, as it so happens, historically, Galton um, was not just biologically related to Darwin, but <clears throat> he did use some of his seminal ideas <clears throat> in genetics to propose uh, things like eugenics, eugenics programs. So um, again, this this is further evidence that it's not a huge um, jump of logic or leap of logic to maintain that there is um, and to, to some extent has been a connection uh, between um, Darwinism and um, eugenics or the wishful um, manner by which governments and other agencies might attempt to uh, sterilize and or euthanize individuals who 
are um, deemed unfit um, to society or to some presumed um, evolutionary process in history. Thank you.